Hello, right. Ethereum. I think we're live. We are. Hello, Ethereum Singapore community. This is uh, William from Hopper together with Dr. Sebastian Burgo. Welcome to our presentation. Yeah, thank you, William. And first of all, welcome Singapore. Very happy to take this opportunity to present Hopper, um, also in that part of the world. Kind of sad that I can't uh, be there in person, but very happy to take this opportunity to um, yeah present present Hopper to you in a virtual format. So uh, what I'm going to present in the next uh, half an hour, I'll just present my screen, um, is the Hopper privacy protocol. So what we're building is about data exchange in the digital world, which we see as really the foundation of our modern world. So we're exchanging billion times a day data with some other parties around. We're sending data packets around. And we think that the internet already happens today in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. However, what we many times don't consider is how we are threatened by an increasing number of rogue actors around us. And with rogue actors, we're typically thinking about some hackers, spies, and whatnot. But uh, what we see increasingly is that there's another type of attackers. And um, that is actually private for-profit companies that are running an increasing amount of the digital infrastructure that are running our modern world. And what we also see is, again, an increasing number of control, censorship, and oversight that, um, yeah, that, that uh, governments are trying to, to make over these infrastructure that should belong to all of us. So how are we at Hopper trying to reclaim the internet? How are we trying to bring privacy back to the infrastructure that all of us use? So what we're building is actually a multi-hop onion routing network. So what this means is, and some of you might be familiar with Tor, um, an onion routing scheme. So if you, Alejandro, want to send data, say, to Zoe, instead of sending it directly to Zoe, which would expose your IP address, you're sending it actually through the Hopper network. And in the Hopper network, we have, in this case, three intermediate relay nodes, which are Betty, Chow, and Dimitro, which are relaying your traffic. So Betty is the first party which receives a data packet, as visualized here by the yellow ball that is hopping from one hop to the next. And Betty is taking one of the onion shells, these blue rings, off before passing on a data packet to Chow, who takes off one layer of the onion encryption, passing it on to Dimitro, who passes on to Zoe. And only the last person, Zoe, is able to decrypt this packet. In this way, we have not just end-to-end -end encryption, but we have also obfuscated who is talking with whom in this relay chain. And again, this is so far exactly the same what you see with Tor. Um, that works relatively well, but it has actually a number of attack vectors. And specifically, you could follow a packet as it traverses along its path and can actually find out who is talking to who. And to approve that, specifically against a so-called global passive adversary, we are building a mixnet. So instead of just taking data packet and passing it on, we have here kind of a zoomed in view of our network, which is not just receiving data from one person, but actually to a number of peers in the network. And what this relay hop is doing is that it's caching the packets for a short amount of time and then sending them out in a different random order. So that means that only the node operator themselves would know where traffic came from and where it goes. And what we're doing thereby is that even a one of these global passive adversaries, you can think about it as your internet service provider, right? So your internet service provider knows about every single packet that comes into your home router and also your computer and goes out. So even with such a level of oversight, you could not link the incoming and outgoing traffic. And this unlinkability is one important property that um, Tor or simple online routing schemes do not have, but mixed net nets actually do have. 
So this is what one of these mixed node operators is uh, doing. But you might ask yourself, why would they actually do it? They do that because they get incentivized for operating a node. And here for the Ethereum meetup specifically, uh, there might be some of you who are already uh, familiar with payment channels. Otherwise, um, there's a quick recap here on how simple Ethereum payment channels work. So let's say we have two parties on our, on our uh, chain so that are relaying data. So Betty sends data to Chow. Before they can interact to send data towards one another on the Hopper network, they need to open a payment channel. So a payment channel is nothing else than a smart contract that isn't actually very complex. So a very simple payment channel smart contract you can write in under 100 lines of solidity. It's literally just a smart contract where you can lock tokens. So Betty is putting in some tokens and Chao is putting in some tokens. And these tokens are locked in the smart contract. And it can only be taken out when uh, you can provide a signature from the other party about an amount that they agreed on. So in a first step, both are paying in funds from their wallet to the payment channel depicted here in the middle by this contract. Now, after they have locked funds in the smart contract, this allows them to bilaterally pay themselves without having to go via the blockchain. We all know that, especially these days, transactions on Ethereum are painfully expensive and slow, right? So we couldn't actually relay data if it would take every single time about a minute that a data packet would be forwarded and if it would cost you between 10 to $100. That would just not be economically feasible in any way. So after having locked money in the smart contract, Betty and Chao can actually interact and every single time a data packet is passed from Betty to Chao, and also when, when passing back from Chao to Betty, they receive so-called tickets from one another. So you can imagine that a little bit like a raffle ticket, right? So when passing a data packet from Betty to Chao, she is receiving a ticket from Chao. And this ticket, ticket has a signature from him on. Right, so Betty has a ticket that says, "Herewith, I Chow am signing that Betty now owes that that I owe Betty one of these virtual tokens." I say virtual tokens because they haven't been settled on the L1, L1 being the blockchain, right? So we call this sometimes L1. That's our layer one, and what we built on top of that is this layer two scaling solution, which is just uh, in a bilateral fashion being settled. So now Betty is getting a ticket whenever she sends a packet to Chao, and Chao is receiving a ticket from Betty whenever he sends something successfully to her. And uh, what we have achieved in this way is that we make this system at Hopper cheat proof, right? So actually, Betty is only receiving um, a ticket from Chao if she passed on the data packet to the next downstream party. I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail um, at a later stage. So after both of these parties have received a bunch of tickets, it might be that they want to say, OK, I made a decent amount of profit for running a hopper node, and I want to settle this profit on L1. I want to flip my um, tokens for, I don't know, DAI and buy myself something nice with it, right? Or buy myself ETH or whatever. So after like some, some amount of time, they can do that whenever they want to. They take the tickets that they have accumulated on the L2 and they settle them. So in a first step, you can do a netting. You can do a netting of both tickets and coins. And whatever is left then is paid out both to Betty and to Chao in their wallets outside of the smart contract. So basically you're netting the tickets you're seeing, okay, who owes whom what. You're seeing the corresponding amount of tokens that are shuffled from left to right or right to left, taken out, and then people can go off and do whatever they want to with it freely. So that is a way how we achieve scalability at Hopper for having the ability to relay tickets and data packets quickly and efficiently without having much cost involved. Now, 
as an overview of our initial picture where we have seen um, where we've seen this tour like example, what is actually happening is that in parallel to the data packet on top, we're also seeing a payment that is being forwarded on the bottom. So in parallel with sending data, Alejandro is sending three tokens to Betty. Upon forwarding the data to Chao, Betty receives a key to unlock her payment. Betty is then forwarding the data packet to Chao and the two remaining tokens over to Chao, who passes it on. So thereby, by having this slightly lagging unlock, so Betty only receives the uh, key to unlock her payment from Chao after having forwarded the, um, the data packet, we are incentivizing the participants of the network to act honestly. And if you're cheating, so basically you're just not doing any work, you will not receive the second key half from the downstream node. And without that, you cannot unlock the payment. If you're sending bogus data to the downstream because you were manipulating something in between, the downstream node will also not be able to, um, yeah, to, to derive the key half and not be able to pass it to you. And again, you will get no payment. So this is the way how we are incentivizing honest and uh, collaborative behavior in the Hopper network. So this packet-based payment scheme is scalable because it's an L2 solution. It's cheat proof because we have this key sharing mechanism and therefore it allows us to not just pass data around in a private fashion, but also incentivize the node runners that are actually running the network. Now you might be asking, well, how do people actually do that? And we see that running a node is hard. Um, and that's why we decided to support everyone by releasing a hardware node in collaboration with our friends at Avado. So we have a custom branded Avado node for Hopper. And by doing that, we're actually helping decentralizing not just Hopper, but also Ethereum. So you can get yourself one of these hardware nodes. It's around $500 each. And you can probably imagine why it's so expensive. Uh, it's not that Avado is making a lot of profit on it, but it's actually a machine that can run an Ethereum node. You can actually also run an ETH2 node on it. And it has a terabyte SSD in it, which is unfortunately a little bit pricey. If you don't want an Ethereum node, you could run this on way cheaper hardware. It should be possible to run this on under $100. Actually, in our last test net, we had seen some people who were running Hopper nodes on a Raspberry Pi 4. I don't know the exact price point of that one, but it's significantly cheaper, again, because you don't have the uh, capabilities required to, need to run a full Ethereum node. So um, with that, we have created the ability to have a node running in your home, running a Hopper node, monetizing your unused internet bandwidth, and in parallel also running an Ethereum node, which is of course especially important for Hopper, more so than for some random DeFi projects, because Hopper more than other DeFi and other applications does rely on actual kind of private interactions with an Ethereum node and without being censorable by central service providers. Um, that's, of course, not to say that you have to buy a node to participate in Hopper. You can very well um, run Hopper on your own machine. Uh, we have a bunch of instructions for all major operating systems, uh, and you can check out our code, which is, of course, all open source on GitHub. So it's github.com slash hoppernet. You find uh, all our code for, for Hopper. Now, Finally, I would like to um, go to a last chapter, which I'm personally very excited about and um, which I see uh, happily getting a lot of attention in the Ethereum ecosystem, which is governance. Who decides how we build such privacy infrastructure? So maybe privacy infrastructure should be built by governance right, by governments around the planet that decide on, on what is good. Now, I think most of us can agree here that maybe governments should not be in charge of building infrastructure that decide on the well-being of individuals. The second obvious option is private for-profit corporations, right? 
But also here we have seen how private for-profit corporations do not have usually the best interest of an individual at heart. So also private for-profit corporations are maybe not the best. Finally, probably that's a face that outside Switzerland has not been seen very publicly. Maybe there should be some partnership between private for-profit corporations and uh, governments. And also here in Switzerland, we have seen some things going very wrong in the past decades. So specifically what we have seen in Switzerland is a private corporation that provided privacy infrastructure, so privacy devices, private telephone lines, private internet communication devices and whatnot, to pretty much most governments around the world. And this is really absolutely mind boggling. So there was a private, supposedly Swiss company that provided really for top level governments around the world, devices, software and everything related to it. And it took a few decades until it came out that this corporation actually belonged to the US and German Secret Service. So that is an example of, um, yeah, how private corporations, especially in cooperation with governments, are typically a very bad idea for running privacy infrastructure. So that brings us a little bit back to the topic of how does government governance work anyway? So as humans, we get together and we want to do something good, right? So we want to just do it as one company likes to say. It. But also as humans, we realize that chaos of non-coordinated work really sucks. So many times um, individuals then revert to a centralized king solution. Unsurprisingly, the king is oftentimes declaring that they are the center of the world and they can do whatever they want to with their underlings. So what we want for Hopper is to provide a privacy utility. We are looking for governance without queens and kings. We're looking for transparency and not protectionism and creating really what I like to call a digital commons. So it is infrastructure that does not have an owner that is for everybody who wants to use it. And what we want to do, and this is a major breakthrough in the research domain over the past decades, that we want to bring financial incentives to such privacy infrastructure. For a long, long time, this has been deemed impossible because financial incentives would break up the privacy guarantees that you're trying to create in the first place. Now, only since the advent of public ledgers, such as Ethereum and layer two scaling solutions, we do have the ability to run such things. In fact, without running through central service providers and central gatekeepers that could censor us, break the network and break the privacy guarantees. Now, how do we build this? We built this in an open source fashion. We built permissionless software so the new open, right? We've seen this, this open word kind of being hyped uh, 10 years ago. So to me, permissionlessness is really the new open. And we would like to take this tokenized governance that we see for a bunch of projects to the next level by not just letting tokenized governance decide on technical parameters of the network, but also on the actual governance of the legal entity behind Hopper the Hopper Association. How we go about this is a little bit different from a uh, kind of naive token based voting scheme. And I would like to spend a few more minutes on that topic. So there's a problem with democratic elections. First of all, democratic elections are typically one person, one vote. It might be that Alice has a legitimate interest in a topic. And Alice cares a lot more than everybody else who doesn't really give so much about a particular decision. But still, Alice just gets one vote, right? So there's three participants in our toy example here, which care very much about a topic, uh, which don't care so much about a topic. And Alice cares very much about it. Still, they all have the same vote. Is that fair? You can argue that maybe it's not because maybe 
Alice has a vested best interest at heart for providing something good for this cause. On the other end of the spectrum, we have this typical share corporation one dollar one vote mechanism. So in large corporations, um, this is quite common. You have a shareholder assembly where people get together and vote on, on topics that are to be decided upon. And here we see the topic that I talked about before, that there might be this little killer whale here behind the scenes that is controlling the entity sometimes directly and sometimes as in the uh, example that got subverted by Secret Service um, in secrecy, right? And this is pretty bad. So now the individual little fish have almost no way of influencing any decision-making processes uh, that they do care about, but they just don't have the dollar amounts to make up for it. And there's a very interesting common ground between these two extremes. So the two extremes, again, being one person, one vote, like in most democratic elections, and one dollar, one vote, as seen in share corporations. And that is called quadratic voting. So quadratic voting is a means of voting where the costs for a vote increase with the number of votes. So if you want to cast one vote, it costs you one token. Um, if you want to get a second vote, that second vote costs you two tokens. So in total, it's three. If you want to cast a third vote, it's going to cost you an additional three tokens. So the total is six. So what you see is that the number of tokens that a certain vote costs you increases quadratically with the number of votes that you want to cast. Or put in other words, the number of tokens required for a vote is the square root um, of, the, uh, of the votes. So seeing a little example here, um, taking again the example with our, with our killer whale, um, if we have this example whereby this killer whale is actually um, controlling 71% of the votes in a $1, one vote uh, scenario, um, we would have no way to kind of contain the power of this whale. Whereas in a quadratic voting example, where the votes equals the square root of the number of tokens, we do see how our three little participants have actually more voting power than this one whale. Now, that is actually very interesting because it allows for both things. If you have a legitimate interest for casting a vote, and if you are a long-term supporter of this project, you do have a larger influence. But again, if there's a huge amount of people that are all poor but still manage to, to um, coordinate a grassroots effort, they do manage to outweigh your potentially harmful intentions on a project. So this makes the project way more resilient than both one person, one vote, which could be overrun, as well as um, one dollar, one vote that would over um, entitle the whales. It is something that, uh, again, was, of course, not invented by Hopper, but um, there's a fantastic blog from Vitalik on this topic from one and a half years ago that I recommend everybody watching, uh, reading. So yeah, that is, um, that is something I recommend. Now, finally, uh, before moving over to the Q&A, I would like to do a quick demo of how Hopper looks like today and show how the Hopper product actually looks like. So what we have here is um, two Hopper nodes. So the first Hopper node is uh, that I'm running here has a bunch of commands. So we're having a web interface for it. And on this Hopper node, by the way, it's running on Gurley, so it's all uh, kind of fake money. I have a certain number of Hopper tokens and I have some Gurley ETH on it. I also have a second node here, um, which also balance, which also has some girly ETH on it, and it also has some uh, some girly hopper on it, right? So these are not uh, kind of mainnet um, assets. These are only only test assets that don't have any value. Um, 
both of these nodes are connected to the Ethereum blockchain, and they have some payment channels open. So this one has one payment channel open. The other one has, yeah, uh, no channels I wanted to check out, has two payment channels open. Um, so let's just call it address now. So we see the address of these nodes. We see here their Ethereum address and the corresponding Hopper address. And what we can do with that, actually, I just to make life easier, we have this alias command. So I call this node here Alice, and the second one is Bob, right? So I created an alias for Bob. And the first thing we can do is we ping Bob and see, is Bob around? Yes, Bob is around. And Bob can check. Bob also has a list of alias. So he has Alice. And let's check from Bob's side if Alice is alive. And we see, yes, Alice is also around. That's good. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to send a so-called zero hop message. So I'm just going to send a message that does not go via any intermediate nodes um, to Bob. That's why there's uh, no name before the comma here. That's where I would put theoretically the intermediate nodes. There's none, so I keep it empty. I say, hey, Bob, this is Alice. So this is being sent over. Let's see if it got there. Yes, Bob got a message. This is kind of cool. So Bob writes back, send Alice. Hi, Alice. Nice to uh, hear you're on Hopper. And Alice also got the message. Cool. So far, so good. Now let us open a first payment channel. So um, Alice is opening a payment channel now to Bob. OK, so she uses Bob's hopper address. And she just uses this open command, pastes Bob's address, and enters amount of hopper tokens. I will just open, enter a very tiny amount of hopper tokens. On mainnet, we might bump the number of hopper tokens minimally required per, um, per, per channel. But so far, there is no limit. You can open a teeny tiny channel. So now this is running on Gurley. So it's going to take a bit for this uh, channel to appear. Um, so, so far, I still just see the, the two channels that are here um, that, that were there already in the first place. And from that moment on, we have a channel that's funded from Alice to Bob. And then Alice can send uh, multi-hop messages um, across, that, across that channel. Um, good. While we're waiting for this transaction, OK, I was going to take some questions. Seems the channel is not quite there yet. Just got a ticket. OK, while we're waiting for this transaction to settle, I will take, actually, I'll try to open the channel from this side here as well. And then I'll take some questions. Uh, I see there's some questions popping up already. Um, so alias, I'm just picking out Bob's address. Um, actually, I'll do it the other way around. I'll open one from here. Um, zero point zero one. Yeah, so that will still take a bit. OK, I will take some questions in the meantime. Um, so there is some questions. Are you planning to move from ETH to BSC? Um, so are we planning to move from Ethereum mainnet to the Binance Smart Chain? Um, we are right now not planning to move to the Binance Smart Chain, uh, but we are actually uh, considering um, launching things on XDAI. So the community engagement is um, the community engagement on XDAI, especially from a developer perspective, is absolutely outstanding. We have been running test nets on both XDAI, on Matic, and on Binance Smart Chain, and the engagement of the community on XDAI has been by far the largest. So um, again, once of course all these side chains uh, do have severe security limitations that we should all be aware of. 
In specifically, they are not censorship resistant. They can be shut down and they can selectively censor individuals. So that's all not great properties, which we would like for a privacy network running at scale, but it is something that is good enough um, for an early version of the uh, Hopper network that is in the launch phase. So yes, we're planning um, to, to run that on potentially on XDAI until the Ethereum mainnet scalability issues have been resolved. Okay, just real quick check. Uh, okay, we see failed transactions. Why did this transaction fail? Well, because the other party just opened the channel at the same time. So there was kind of a collision. So um, that's why I couldn't open the channel in the other direction at the same time. Cool. Uh, so now that the channel is open, we see the third channel op being open here. You see that the total balance of the channel is 0 0.01 hopper. My balance is 0 0.01, so that means it's a unidirectional payment channel that only got funded by me. Now, let's look at some fun stuff that we can do through this. What I will do now as a showcase example is I will send myself a message that goes through Bob, okay? I'm Alice now. Alice sends a message via Bob back to herself. It's kind of a round trip test. So I'm doing send um, via Bob to me, so I have another alias that's called me, and that's my own address. It's called hi from self, this message went via Bob. Let's see if this works. So yes, I got a message back from myself. So my node received a message, hi from self, this message went via Bob. Let's send another message. again via Bob. And again, we get a message here. You do see that we have some uh, increased latency, and that is even though there's not much traffic happening on the network just yet, we do have this packet mixing in place, which adds artificial latency um, to the round trip of a package. Um, and the other fun thing now to see is that um, Bob, when Bob looks at the channels, they still see, oops, that took a bit. They still see that it's, uh, my balance is zero. Huh, hasn't Bob just earned some money? It's a trick question. Yes, Bob has earned some tickets, but these tickets have not been redeemed on the payment channel smart contract yet. So what we can see is that we type tickets that they have are indeed two unredeemed tickets with a sum of 0 0.0002 hopper. So this is, again, what I mentioned before on my slides. This is an unsettled amount of hopper, which are not yet settled on the blockchain. So what Bob is doing now is he's doing a redeemed tickets. And what redeemed tickets does, it's basically uh, doing the first step of taking the money and going out, which is saying, hey, dear blockchain, here are two tickets. Please settle them for me. Okay, and afterwards we should see that the um, balance of the um, of the channel increased in Bob's favor. Probably again, that's uh, going to take a bit until the transaction got mined. In reality, you would of course not do that for such a teeny tiny amount of hopper. You would probably do that maybe once a month when you see that's economically viable and you did make a profit versus the gas fees. Okay, some more questions that we got from the audience. How do I buy hardware to run nodes? Um, so we actually have, you can go on hoppernet.org slash node. Um, actually, let me check if that is up um, slash node. Yes, so you see here how this works. You can run your own thing, which links you to our docs, or you can order one from Avado. So the Avado uh, store has the Hopper node um, on stock here. Um, that's how you get a, oops, wrong window. That's how you get a Hopper node. Again, you can totally run this on your own hardware. If you have um, a server running already somewhere, if you have your own Ethereum node running somewhere, you can totally install Hopper there. Um, we also added that to the chat, actually. William was adding the link. Um, 
No, there is some other questions uh, on quadratic governance. Is that the route Hopper is taking? Yes, but there is one big caveat to be aware of for quadratic voting, and that it is that it has one limitation, which is civil attacks. So you can only do quadratic voting if you have some assurance that you're actually working with individuals. What this means is that we cannot use um, quadratic voting for a completely anonymous voting scheme. So we will use uh, quadratic voting within Hopper Association. So for the General Assembly of the members of the association, if you want to vote out the board, for example, I'm a member of the board, if you want to vote me out, you can become a member of the association. That is, again, not anonymous. But that is the price we have to pay for uh, running an anonymous, uh, uh, sorry, not anonymous, but for running a quadratic voting scheme. And in addition, it's a requirement for the Swiss Association, right? So if you want to become a member of the Swiss Association, you can do so just by holding Hopper tokens. And then you will vote quadratically with the tokens that you hold at the point in time of the General Assembly. For the governance of technical parameters of the network, which is an anonymous vote, which anybody can participate in, it is actually a one token, one vote scheme. Again, because otherwise you could sibil it with a thousand accounts and just take over the network. Um, I see some other questions on, do you already have agreements with business? Maybe some of the companies are already planning cooperation. Yes, we have actually a partnership where we're piloting to use Hopper in the medtech industry. Medtech industry is very interesting because it is actually just starting to begin, begin digitalization. Hopper is not just for crypto. Yes, it needs crypto people like me and all of you to run nodes. However, we want Hopper to be used by the real world out there. Hopper should be used by a large amount of businesses out there that have a demand for data privacy, like let alone for compliance reasons. So what we see, and this is a, really an example scenario for the entire medtech industry, if you transmit data from a highly regulated environment to an unregulated cloud provider, you must not, at least according to European data privacy uh, laws, GDPR, you must not expose the IP address of the sender and now what that means is you need a network like Hopper to run uh, such applications, kind of normal Web2 applications in a highly regulated environment such as hospitals. These are examples that actually need Hopper if they're serious about data privacy. And we're seeing an increasing number of laws and regulations that actually enforce that. Good. Um, we see another question. Let me see what else do we have. Um, yeah, so on the hardware note, actually, um, I got one here. So if you still see my camera, William, you still see my camera, maybe? Just to give me a heads up. So this is one of the Hopper hardware notes. It's uh, relatively small, actually. It's, um, yeah, you can run it in your living room. It's fanless, so it doesn't make noise. You can run it in your bedroom if you want to. Um, it's like a small blue box which runs uh, your Hopper Note. Um, yeah, that again, a shout out to our partners at Avado who are helping us with the management of this entire system. So then we have another question on how do you launch the decentralized governance of Hopper? That's actually a very good question because we are um, we started that process about two, three weeks ago. The question is, how do you launch it? The normal answer is you have a team and a team is saying what gets done. And then they say, we have this stepwise decentralization that just never happens and the team just remains in charge. That's what I see by and large. Now at Hopper, we decided to take this series and take another approach, also because we've seen that we have a very active and engaged community who helped us out a lot during the early times of very quirky test nets. So what we said is we take this community of over 3,000 people who are running Hopper nodes, and we let them be in charge of the launch of the network, including the governance. So 
the current governance of Hopper is actually, um, I think you still see my screen, is running on a snapshot page. So snapshot page is a governance tool that's used by a ton of DeFi projects out there, but also by, um, by Hopper. So and what you can see here is you see the so-called Hopper Genesis DAO. The Hopper Genesis DAO comprises the 3,344 people who were um, participating in Hopper test nets. And you see that we have a large amount of proposals that we got here. And the next step, we had um, then a final proposal being voted on the top three. So let me show you that one. So, and in the final Hopper token launch distribution, which made me very happy, is not just the outcome. In fact, I wasn't even in favor of this outcome, um, but we went with it anyway, because that's what the community voted for. But what blew me away was seeing the engagement here. So, we see 1,521 votes um, in this final proposal. So again, just underlying to me that we have a, a large amount of participants that were participating here, voting on the Hopper token launch and picking a clear winner. So that is, um, that is the governance of Hopper today. Um, good. So I will take maybe two more questions. Um, yeah, there's a critical question, which I like. So average Joe is too lazy to use Hopper network. Secret agencies don't need it. And companies have their own privacy networks, IT security departments. Who will be the consumer of Hopper network? Totally fair question. I don't think that like this quirky interface, which I showed here, will be used by average Joe. I think average Joe will uh, connect to a VPN, just like my VPN that, that I have here. They click on VPN enable, and that's it. This VPN will then go through Hopper. Um, and that is basically what uh, I see um, corporations, again, like MedTech providers who are not able to work with existing VPN solutions because you're just outsourcing outsourcing your metadata to another centralized honeypot of data. So yeah, we do think that such use cases, which abstract away the complexity of the Hopper protocol behind the scenes is a viable path forward for people actually using Hopper. Um, yeah, all right. I think with that, we have addressed most of the questions. I ran a little bit over time. Um, if you have other questions, I uh, invite you to join our um, to join our channels. So we can William will share them on the chat afterwards. You find us, for example, on Telegram, on um, slash Hoppernet. You also find us, of course, on Twitter or on our website. Very happy to join the discussion. Um, if you have any questions, we're there for you to answer them on all these channels. Thank you so much. Best wishes to Singapore. I wish you a wonderful evening and best wishes from Switzerland. All the best and bye-bye.